Kishore, I would now like to switch gears a bit because you represent a multinational company and uh, you have seen the new government come in. You saw the earlier regime which was there. Uh, what has changed in your view? And how would you as a multinational company now view India as some place where you'll say, okay, I will put more investment here because uh, there are investment dollars to go in and there are many countries to choose from. So how would you view it and uh, are the changes good enough or are you looking for something more? Well, thank you, Richard. I think uh, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is the sentiment, right? I mean, the sentiment is the key here. People are more, you know, people have a very positive attitude towards it. The optimism is at an all-time high and the can-do attitude, I think, has come back a lot over the last five months when I look at it. Now, for a multinational, when we come into a country like India, you know, lots of times it's about, you know, what can we do in terms of reforms of labor, in terms of reforms of, you know, doing business, ease of doing business, and taxes, of course, is prime in everybody's mind in many different forms. But I think what we have seen is, in our small MRO that we had in uh, Mumbai, we had to every year renew about 34 licenses. And 34 licenses meant that you had 34 different inspectors, if not more than that, who would come on an annual basis and ask us questions in order for us to keep renewing the things. Today, what I'm led to believe, and practice will show it into the future, but uh, you know, it is all online, and so we have an uh, obligation to file and say that we are meeting all these requirements that is established by the government, and then on a lottery basis, people do come and inspect your facility, for which a report will be filed within 72 hours. So bottom line is there's transparency, there's speed at which things can be achieved, and I think at the end of the day, that translates into the ease of doing business. When there is ease of doing business, then it's a natural space to participate. Whether it be the aerospace sector, infrastructure sector, retail, consumer, any which way you look at it, the three Ds that the Prime Minister had mentioned, which is demographics, right, democracy, and demand, I think it applies fantastic to any multinational that wants to do business in this country. So beyond all this, I think the Make in India campaign, we are already participating in manufacturing in this country, but we wanted to grow that manufacturing. So what it meant was we needed to have proper capabilities. Building capacities is easy in the services sector. So if you want more engineers, no problem, right? There's enough companies to help you do that. But when you want more suppliers, I think what's extremely important is the supply chain has to grow first. Supply chain will lead to localization through assembly, packaging, and that will automatically lead into larger manufacturing spaces from the aerospace segment. In other smaller segments, it's going to be totally demand-driven. Of the short cycle in nature, it'll be demand-driven. So key, I think, for foreign companies to come here is a ease of doing business, availability of skills, right, capabilities, and a need that is perceived by the government and followed by the government to enable MNCs to do more business in this country. Can I ask a follow-up question to you? Uh, as you are seeing all these reforms getting rolled out, some of them are policy statements, some of them are intents, and some of them are actually regulatory changes that he's making, like getting rid of this inspector Raj and you know, all those kind of, uh, st uh, this thing that are going on. So how would your um, uh, group, um, say uh, wherever investment decisions are being made uh, in, um, in Rolls-Royce, uh, view India as an investment destination today compared to say a year back? Well, the, the first point is, even uh, as you're going through the last few years, it was very clear for us to participate in India, it cannot be a sell in India and take the profits back. Sure. It has got to be entwined within the fabric in India. Now, what is happening more with the Make in India campaign is that is just making it that much more in your face, saying you have to do more. But not only saying you have to do more, I think it is to say, if you want to do more, we also want to do the same. And here are the things we can do together. For example, we have the capability to do advanced technology development with a lot of agencies in this country to build the next generation aircraft here, to build the next generation engine here. And we are wanting to do that. We are willing to do that. And I think a framework that will enable us to do that is what is showing up more clearly, very clearly, in fact. Sure. Thank you. 
Uh, I think this Make in India is definitely, uh, we heard it strongly from you, we heard Arun talk about it and we heard Jyoti talk about it earlier when he spoke about the small and medium sector industry which actually contributes a large component to the GDP of this country. Uh, Jyoti, I just want to ask you one uh, follow-on question on uh, while we spoke about ease of doing business and uh, we understand it and you, you are advising so many of your clients, both multinational, local and uh, corporates, etc. How are they seeing, how are you seeing the regulatory changes or the regulations that are there in this country? How are they impacting your clients and uh, uh, what advice are you giving your clients in this regard? First of all, just one comment on uh, Make in India. It's uh, one of my usual one-liners and which says we have to make sure that we do not lack let make in India get trumped by made in India laws and regulations. I think that requires a clap. We just have to make that sure. <laughs> Otherwise, it's ain't going to happen. Trust me, it won't happen. We got too much, we got too much of a jungle of rules and regulations around that it won't make it happen unless we change stuff. I think we, we have some challenges in that space and I, and I see as one of the challenges from experience is just the, the capacity of the regulators. Uh, these are very early days and we are seeing you know, a wide range. There are regulators and regulators with different roles, some of them merely advisory and some of them are all powerful in their, in their spaces. The thing that we are seeing actually is, and, and that's something which concerns me, and I will include not only regulators, I would say broadly institutions. One of the things which concerns me is that we do not seem to have some kind of a national consensus or some kind of a convergence between the regulators, the institutions, and the stakeholders as to what is it that we as a country are trying to, to achieve. Now, I'll give you just two examples and how it impacts the economic growth and the, and the economic story that we have to tell. Let's just take two instances of the 2G licenses which got cancelled and the coal allocations which got cancelled. I'm not here trying to justify that what happened in those allocations was right or wrong. The issue is that you have cancelled licenses in these two spaces where hundreds and thousands of crores of debt is involved. So you can say, okay, private capital may be all bad, they do wrong things, but you have stranded assets today. And there are 43 mines out of those 214 which are actually being developed. Some of them are in production. And now we say, shut all this down. Now, if we are going to let regulators and institutions create stranded assets, that's really bad story. That's really a bad story because that's no good for the economy. So in terms of very Puritan way of looking at law versus saying is it outcome based, do we have any other solution other than cancellation and destroying all the economic activity that has occurred? And I think that creates all sorts of problems. And one of the problems is in all of the large scale investments that are required, long term investments, certainty is very important. And the regulators have to keep that in mind. And my, my one-liner on Vodafone was, that we as lawyers used to say, future is uncertain. But what happens when past becomes uncertain? Just imagine. And that's happened with coal, that's happened with telecom. So it's good, maybe there were bad facts and therefore good law. But I think institutions and regulators have to think that what is the impact of what they do and is there another way of achieving that result of natural resources and so on being used on reasonable terms and for welfare of all. So I think the regulators have still a long way to go and clearly, very clearly, if we do not get this convergence, uh, we are going to be struggling. I mean, I, I, mean, I see three scenarios. Uh, one, the, the, the speed at which this convergence can be achieved. If there's no convergence, you have things of falling apart. I would call it a 3% growth rate. I would call it muddling along, you know, where things, some things work, some things don't work, and that you're looking at a 4, 5% growth rate. But if we want to get to 7, 8, 9, then it's like a flotilla advancing. People have to think, 
in the same lines, along the same lines, and I'm not saying that the court should not overrule wrong executive decisions. It's within the constitutional provisions, but there are ways and means that the regulators can work together and in a way which is towards certain national objectives. So we are still in early days, but some of the things that have happened uh, really don't inspire much, and I think things have to change. Uh, thank you, uh, Jyoti. I think uh, regulation is a challenge. And, uh, you know, I heard somebody once say that we should put a ban on regulation for the next five years and start enforcing what we have got. I think that may be good for this country. Maybe it's time to do some of these. We'll have to take, uh, we are living in a transformational time. We'll have to take decisions which are transformational and just not minor changes because transformation, what is happening around the world with the digital revolution that is happening, I think uh, uh, it's very important that India does not miss that wave of it because the only way for India to reach the vast interiors like what mobiles did for telecom, I think we'll need to find ways in which we can actually take it there. I would like to uh, thank my fellow panel members uh, for the insights that they have provided and for the time that they've come here. And I'd like to thank the audience for your patience in listening to us at this time. So thank you very much.